Well, this is the 13th and last lecture in EP1027, which is Maxwell's equations in electromagnetic waves. And the agenda for this last lecture is the following. First, I'll talk about radiation emitted from point charges. And particularly, in order to get to that, uh, I'll talk about what uh, retarded potentials are. These are actually solutions to um, the Maxwell equations or in terms of the potential formulation of Maxwell equation in terms of the charge distribution. These potential solutions are known as the linear Wishart potential. And then we'll talk about the uh, radiation uh, emitted, a radiation which is emitted from point charges in motion via this linear Wishart potential. Um, we'll talk about radiation emitted by uh, certain um, special cases, for example, when the velocity of the particle is parallel and perpendicular to the acceleration of the particle, or in the limit when the particle is moving with small velocity, non-relativistic, much less than speed of light. So we'll talk about this cause those cases in a bit of detail. And then I'll talk about what happens if you have radiation fields not in vacuum, but in dielectrics. In particular, I'll talk about the max cherenkov effect. Most of you, I think, are familiar with this uh, sonic boom kind of effect um, in, in, the, in the context of um, acoustics, uh, sound waves. Uh, here we will see a similar effect is produced when you have radiation in dielectrics. And then I'll talk about radiation emitted by not a single point charge, unlike in the first four, case, uh, first four items on the agenda. However, by a system of point charges. In particular, I'll talk about a half-wave antenna and a dipole antenna. Okay. So the references for this um, uh, lecture are the following. Of course, Griffiths is our textbook. Um, you can find many of these cases treated in chapters uh, 10 and 11. However, um, especially regarding the half-wave antenna, I think Griffith doesn't do a very good job. Uh, neither does it do, do a very good job in talking about um, cases such as when the velocity of a charge is orthogonal to the um, acceleration, so or, which is known as sometimes uh, in the, known as synchrotron radiation. So for that, this book is pretty good, um, Classical Electromagnetic Radiation by Heald and uh, Merian. Uh, this is different from the other book which Marion has, the classical mechanics. And then uh, Ohanian chapter 13 and 14 are also pretty good. You can also look up, look this up. So to begin with, let's look at uh, radiation with point charge. So uh, a point charge at rest or in uniform motion uh, is surrounded by a static or quite a static electric and magnetic field. We've seen this before. Now as long as the point charge remain in a state of uh, rest or uniform motion, these fields move with the point charge as though they were rigidly attached to it. So consider this diagram on the left. This is the electric field created by a point charge at rest. And when this moves with a uniform velocity along, let's say, along the x positive x direction, it drags these field lines are rigidly, you can think of these field lines being rigidly dragged along with these, okay? However, if the point, point charge is then subjected to a sudden acceleration caused by some external force, then the pieces of magnetic and electric field lines, uh, these cannot keep up with the charge and they break away from the point charge and propagate outward as self-supporting um, electromagnetic wave pulse. Now such a wave pulse is a disturbance of uh, static electric and magnetic fields. And this disturbance, as we will see in the next diagram, arises from the need of the electric and magnetic fields to constantly adjust themselves uh, in order for, uh, for them to converge on the on the point charge. So in this figure, you can see uh, this process um, pictorially. What we have here is the point charge initially at rest P. Uh, it receives, it undergoes a, you know, an accelerated motion from to P prime, and then again uniform motion from P prime to Q. There are three points here: P, P prime, and Q. The journey from P to P prime is accelerated, and after that, it it settles down to some um, final velocity and it keeps moving in the uniform velocity till Q. So uh, P and Q are when the charge was, uh, initially was at rest and initially moving at uniform velocity. So for each of these points we know what the field lines would look like. So for P it will be radially outward, for Q it will be radially outward. Um, however, uh, uh, we know that the electric field lines can uh, sort of uh, diverge from this point charge. Uh, 
so the initial electric field lines this here in this diagram we have the final picture when the field lines are um, uh, sort of diverging from Q but initially when the charge was located at P you had electric field lines um, emanating from not eman here yeah, emanating from P now um, from relativity we know that um, this adjustment uh, this field lines which uh, now they are emanating from Q initially they were from P Relativity tells us that this readjustment of this converging, uh, sorry, this uh, diverging from Q from P, um, this cannot be done instantaneously, right? It takes some amount of time. Um, so this is accomplished by this uh, spherical disturbance, as you can see, using the, as this disturbance uh, given by this annulus propagates out, it actually bends these electric field lines in a way. For example, this field line which is far ahead, it only remembers that it was um, radially directed from P, but this uh, um, circular, this spherical, this kink, which is moving out, actually is bending this, um, bending this field line. If it moves out, it will further get bent, and this will uh, now emanate from Q, okay? So, uh, as you can see in this region, in the kink region, which is moving outside, moving outwards, in the kink region, the electric field line is not um, radial to Q, but it has a longitudinal component, which is a longer radial, and the transverse component. In the longitudinal component, or the radial component, let me just write, the radial component is something which is known as the Coulomb piece, and we will show that it falls as the inverse square of distance, but then the transverse piece, so this in a slanted thing, slanted field line, you can resolve it into, uh, as you know, the tangent to the field line gives you the electric field, so the tangent can be resolved into a radial direction, and the transverse direction, okay? Transverse to the, uh, which is tangential to the circle. So this transverse piece is something which is the radiation piece, and it actually we will show that it falls off as one over R. Now, uh, if you remember the definition of the pointing vector it was uh, proportional to the product of E and B. So e if, if E falls as one over R square, B will also fall as one over R square. So the product of E and B will fall off one over R to the fourth. Now, the area of the sphere is, on the other hand, grows as r square. So 1 over r to the fourth, which is the pointing vector, multiplied by r square, which is the area. Uh, pointing vector, you know, is the area uh, energy emitted per unit area. So if I take the product of the pointing vector with the area, that will give you the energy being lost per unit time. And 1 over r to the four, eb, and then integral of that over r square. So that, is, that will fall off as 1 over r square as well, the whole thing, the energy per unit time. So when you take r goes to infinity, 1 over r squared goes to 0. So that means in the Coulomb field, uh, Coulomb piece, uh, no uh, energy actually reaches infinity because it, it, it diminishes and at infinity nothing really reaches. On the other hand, uh, consider the radiation piece which falls off as 1 over r. The radiation piece, uh, E falls off one, 1 over r, then B also analogously falls off 1 over r. And then the product is 1 over r squared. And then the area of this uh, kink, which grows as r square. So the product of 1 over r square and the area of the kink, which is r square, if you take the product, is uh, finite. It doesn't fall away with r. It, in fact, it, it remains constant. So this actually survives to infinity. It, it reaches. And somebody observing here from infinite distance will be able to see the radiation coming out. Okay, so this was a pictorial way of looking at it. Now let's do the math and we'll see this thing happening. So for that, we need the concept of something which is known as the retarded potential. So what, is, what are retarded potentials? Retarded potentials are a solution to Maxwell equations for a generic charge distribution with, and when charges are moving with arbitrary, arbitrary velocities and so on. So let's recall Maxwell equation in terms of potentials. Remember Maxwell equation in terms of potential, especially in its Lorentz gauge, looks very pleasant. Uh, you have this uh, phi and A. Uh, and the, the scalar potential has a scalar source, which is the charge density, and the vector potential has a vector source, which is the current density. So these two equations, we will use the notation in which these two equations will be fused together in a single equation. The way we do it is that we combine phi and A into a four vector. So as you can see, three components of A and phi over C. Phi over C is something which is the speed of light, is something which is called the fourth component or the zeroes component. And this component, uh, this uh, quantity, which has three components of the space of the magnetic vector potential and the electric scalar potential as the zeroth component, 
it has four components. This four component object is known as the four vector potential. Uh, the name is pretty obvious why it's called a four vector because it has four components, three spatial and one zeroth component, the time-like component. Okay. Similar to the sources, we will combine into a four object, four component object, which is known as the um, four current density. Um, the three, one, two, three component is the same as the uh, current density, but the zeroth component is this charge density multiplied by C. This multiplication by C and division by C, these are the, uh, there for dimensional reasons, okay? Um, because rho, rho and J do not have the same dimension, so if you want to package them in a single object, you make sure that they have the same dimension. So dimension, dimensional uh, equality can be restored by wherever you need, you put a factor of C, okay? So uh, if you combine these two using this four vector notation, the Maxwell equation for potential look very compact. So they will look in like this, okay? So actually uh, I'm using this weird notation, I don't know why. One over C squared epsilon naught can be used as mu naught, but maybe because I don't like mu naught, that's why I put this thing. But yeah, you can think of it that box A mu, box is this operator, this operator which is what I'm calling box in Dalembarshan acting on a mu, and remember a mu has four component, equals minus j mu over, something like this. Okay, and you can verify yourself. The zeroth component will should give you this equation, and then one to three component should give you one to three component of this vector equation, okay? So these two equations are fused into a single equation, which is very nice looking. And the solution to this equation, I'm not gonna do this because uh, it takes a while to solve uh, it's not complicated, but it's just that uh, you haven't done this thing unless you have taken a course on PDEs. And the way to solve the, this partial differential equation is by using something which is known as the Green's function. However, most of you probably won't know what a Green's function is. Uh, it will be taught in some course in partial differential equation, which we'll do, do later in an advanced course. For the time being, you should just be happy that verifying that this is the solution. So uh, I will write down the solution, which looks something like this, and then you can plug it in this equation and check that indeed this is the solution, okay? So, you know, verification is also kind of a proof, so that you should be happy just by verifying this. And uh, don't worry, somebody will teach you how to actually solve this equation when you learn partial differential equations and uh, using solving partial differential equations using the Green's function method. Okay, so uh, what are the uh, gross features of this solution? So, um, as you can see, uh, this is, the f potential created at time t, at a time t and at a location x, is given by this integral over the charge distribution or the current distribution. Uh, so x prime is the location of the current element. So d cube time d cube x x prime times j mu is the current element, divided by one over uh, x uh, divided by x minus x prime. Um, so one important thing is that um, this potential created at at time t. I'm sorry. Potential at time t is not created by the child distribution at time t. Instead, it is created by child distribution at some earlier time, t prime, which is t minus something. So this is if t is 2, uh, if you're observing at uh, the potential at time t equal 2 seconds, this t prime should be 2 minus something. So it's less than 2 seconds. So it was something at, let's say, 1 second. So in the past. So uh, the current uh, potential is determined by the charge distribution in the past. And this makes sense because this has to do with causality. Uh, electromagnetic disturbance propagates with the speed of light. So the current potential at a given location can only be determined by something which came from the past, right? It cannot uh, be instantaneous, right? It cannot have the same time. That means electromagnetic news travels with the infinite speed, which is not possible. So you should remember that the potential at time t is created by charge distribution at some earlier time in the past. That's why these potentials are known as retarded potential because uh, this t, t is greater than t prime. Um, so the current, on the other hand, the current field dist uh, current distribution will produce a potential at some later time. Uh, it's effectively felt only at a later time because the current it, it takes a while for light to travel from the source to the um, field point. So this is exactly what is the, that equation, that uh, time. So if uh, t is the time at which you're receiving this signal at um, time t, and t prime is the time at which the signal came from x prime. But the difference, as you can see, is exactly given by the amount of time light would take, right? 
So the difference in time is equal to difference in length divided by c. That means this is exactly the the difference in the two times is exactly the amount of time light would take from travel to x prime to x. Okay. So uh, this is the most general expression for the sol solution to the Maxwell equation with sources. Of course, um, I'm assuming some kind of boundary condition. So uh, as you know, to solve a partial differential equation, you need boundary condition. So the boundary condition which we are taking here is that the source is localized, okay? That x prime is not spread up to infinity. If it is, then we have to use a different kind of Green's function which we're not using. So this is uh, not the most general solution. You can always add homogeneous solutions to this. However, this is a solution when uh, the source is localized, you can think of it. So uh, now we want to, okay, this was for a general distribution. This is a very important expression known as the retarded potential. Uh, I would advise you guys to go home, uh, you know, not we are already at home, I'm sorry, to, uh, you know, try to prove this by plugging it in this equation. So for that, you need to operate with the box operator on this. Box operator has a bunch of x derivatives and time derivatives. So the x derivative will act on this guy. It will not act on the prime variable because the prime is a dummy variable, but x is not a dummy variable, it's a free variable. It appears only once, but x prime appears uh, more than once and it's a dummy variable. Um, so we have to act with uh, del square Laplace operator. Uh, remember the Laplace operator will not just, uh, will act on uh, t prime because t prime contains x. And then del t prime also will act on t prime because t prime contains t as well. So uh, it's a nice exercise to plug this in this equation and check explicitly this is indeed the solution. It's a very important expression which is known as the retarded potential. Now, uh, uh, next thing we want to look at the radiation from a point charge. Here we were doing, doing for a general charge current distribution. Now we want to specialize for the case of the point charge. So for that, as you know, we need the charge density and the current density for a point charge. So let's look at the electrostatics for the time being, when the charge is not moving. It's at fixed location. What is the density of a point charge located at a location y vector, vector y? So my, since it's a point charge, it has a zero volume. So um, you might think, uh, so the conclusion is that, okay, it is infinite at the location of the point charge because there's finite amount of charge in zero volume. So finite amount of charge divided by zero volume is infinite. And it's zero somewhere, everywhere else it is zero. Outside the point charge, any other location, it is zero. <clears throat> so mathematically, how do we um, represent this? We use the Dirac delta function. So this is our old friend, the Dirac delta function. And the idea is that the density of a point charge can be uh, given by this. It's the product of the charge Q times the delta function. Now you might ask, well, we know the delta function blows up at when uh, X is at the location of the charge. We are happy with that, it is infinite. And it is indeed zero everywhere else, but how do I know exactly know that this is indeed the case, right? So one way to verify this, again, this is not a proof, just a verification, is uh, use Gauss law. So you know Coulomb's law, which leads you to the electric field of a point charge, which looks something like this. Now, according to Gauss law, the charge density is given by this equation. So we just plug this um, expression for the Coulomb electric field for a point charge um, here and is this expression, which is giving you this expression. And this we have done a vector calculus identity, uh, divergence of uh, x by this cube, x minus y by mod of x minus y cube. This we know to be four pi delta functions, times the delta function x minus y, okay? So this we know, it's a well-known vector calculus identity. So the four pi's cancel out and you get q times the delta function. This is exactly what we claim. So the density of a point charge is q times the delta function. Okay, this you should remember. Uh, next time, if I ask you in the exam to write down the uh, point density, charge density of a point charge, you should be able to write this, that the function representation of the density of a point charge. Okay, what about when the point charge starts to move? Well, this was electrostatics. So then the trajectory will not be, uh, not be y equal to constant, but y will be a function of t. So all we have to do is replace this y by the function of t. For example, if it's an oscillating charge, y will be, let's say, a cos omega t and b sin omega t, the x and y component, and z will be zero, something like that. So we have to give, uh, the, remember this delta cube means there are three delta functions, delta function in the x direction, delta function in the y direction, and delta function in the z direction. So uh, we have to give a, uh, a trajectory means giving all the three vectors components as a function of time. 
So once you give the trajectory, so this will give you the density, charge density. What about current density? Current density, most of you know from fluid dynamics that current density is charge density times velocity. And velocity in this case is the y derivative, right? Um, a y derivative, y of t is the trajectory, then y dot of t, the time derivative, will give you the velocity. And rho is q times the delta function. So this is exactly what we have here, okay? So this slide I wanted to keep because I think I forgot to mention about the Dirac delta function representation of a point charge density, charge density, but now you know. Okay. So now that we know uh, what does the point charge density look like, which is something like this, uh, where yt is the trajectory, we can find out the retarded potential, right? We can find out the retarded potential. Again, something which a derivation which I will not do here because... Uh, you know, it's, it's a lengthy thing, it's just uh, high, school, uh, high school calculus you have to do. Actually a bit more than because it's a multivariable. Um, but something which you can, um, you know, do by yourself, you know, from uh, A, uh, you can, you have to do this integral. Here you have to plug in the point charge density and do the integral. Once you do the integral, uh, you can look up on Griffiths or uh, some other book. Um, you can find out that the charge density looks like this. I'm sorry, the potentials look like this. Now, this is the fourth potential. That means I'm talking simultaneously about the scalar potential and the vector potential. If I look at the zeroth component uh, of both sides, that should give you the scalar potential. And if you look look at the one, two, three components, it will give you the components of the magnetic vector potential. Now, here in this V prime of U, uh, V prime of mu, this is the four object, which is the four, uh, some kind of a velocity. Um, velocity, the normal three, three components are the uh, normal velocity. And the fourth, or zeroth component of it is actually the speed of light, C. Okay. And we also have this n hat, which is, you know, the unit vector from the source to the field. Unit vector from the source to the field. You take this. So this, recall what this T prime is. T prime is the retarded time. So the potential created at the current time is created by the this charge um, location at some past time, which is known as the retarded time. Okay. So the, these potentials for the point charge are, goes by the famous name of Leonard Wishart potentials, which were obtained by these um, German, uh, French and German um, physicists um, you know, sometime in the late 1800s. They wrote down this formula. Further, you can find out the EM fields. Once we have the potential, we can find out the EM field by using the map between the potentials and the fields. So once you get the potential, it's easy to find the fields. So the electric field, again, taking you have to take a gradient and then also DDT. Of course, it's going to be a complicated expression, but we're going to focus, we're not going to write the whole thing. We're going to write um, the part which falls as 1 over R. Because remember in the introduction, I mentioned that Electric field produced by moving charges will have a Coulomb piece, which will follow as one over this this quantity squared, and then the radiation piece, which follows one over x minus x prime. So this will survive at infinity, and the Coulomb piece is pretty vanilla. We already know what this looks like and what it does, but we want to explore the effects of the radiative part of the field, so we will explicitly focus on this. And once we have the field E, uh, we can find out um, B as well. And sure enough, because these are radiative field, you will see that this is equal to uh, n hat, the, the direction in which we are, uh, we are looking, times cross cross with e rad, okay, divided by c. Plus, again, the Coulomb piece. Instead of the Coulomb piece, you'll have the Biot-Savart piece, which I don't bother to write, uh, because again, it's uh, some, the physics of which we have already explored in, in McNeil's statics, and there's nothing more to learn from gain from that. So we will focus on the part of uh, we will think of this electric field as the superposition of radiation and Coulomb piece, and they don't really, their effects don't mix. So we can isolate this component and just study this. Okay. Uh, so one one word about the notation you will find in many AM books, including Griffiths, is that the use of the square brackets. Now, the use of the square brackets is to suggest that these velocities and x prime is taken, uh, every x prime is taken at the retarded time, okay? Not the position of the par particle at current time. Although the field is produced at the current time, whenever we put square brackets, it means all the quantities inside, for example, the velocity of the particle, the acceleration of the particle, 
um, the unit vector from the particle to the field, all these will be evaluated from the past in the retarded time. Okay, so whenever you see a square bracket, you should know I'm talking about all these quantities, A prime, V prime, which is the velocity and acceleration of the particle, and this unit vector um, from the uh, particle to the field location where we are measuring the field. All these are evaluated when the particle was at some earlier time known as the retarded time. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, I'm sorry, I think this should also be T prime. I forgot about this. Similarly, so we have again here square brackets. Um, so we can find out the energy flux because this is how much energy is being emitted or by this charge, radiated out by this charge. So as you can guess, this would be a given by the part of the pointing vector, which is the cross product of the radiation field of E and B. You can see, you can uh, the Coulomb pieces will not contribute to radiation and infinity, so that's why I didn't bother about writing them. Although they will do contribute to the pointing vector, that will not be the part of the pointing vector which will survive to infinity. Uh, so, uh, radiation part and radiation part of B, that would, the gray cross product will be giving you the um, pointing vector. And we can, of course, plug in this expression. This expression looks pretty nasty. However, this expression simplifies when you take the velocity V prime to be small compared to the speed of light. Then this factors of V prime over C disappears from everywhere. From the denominator, it disappears. Uh, here it will disappear. And then this n cross, n cross, n hat cross, n hat cross, a prime can be simplified very easily. And you can show in that case that the uh, pointing vector, which is the energy flux per unit area per unit time, uh, is given by this. It is, of course, pointing out to the direction um, from the particle at retarded time to the field location. And, okay. This theta is actually the angle between the um, acceleration and the unit vector. Okay, so a square bracket means unit vector pointing from the particle location at, at retarded time to the current time field point. Current time field point being T. So that angle between them is a theta. So this from this n dot n dot a we will get that term. We get this term. Okay, and R is the shorthand for this um, x minus two. Actually, this should be again. I'm sorry about the, the typo. T prime. Uh, so this pictorially, how do you look at this? How do you see this? Uh, we depict this pictorially by something which is known as the polar plot. So this is the polar plot. Uh, you can see this is the acceleration of the particle, and uh, any particular direction in the field, it is given by uh, this two-dimensional diagram. What we have is your a and theta. Because uh, this, this uh, expression is azimuthally symmetric because it doesn't depend on phi. So uh, this has an axial symmetry. So if this is the particle moving with an acceleration A, there is a rotational symmetry around this axis. And you can, uh, you can rotate this figure, uh, figure around. So these two lobes are because um, in the forward and backward direction when theta is equal to zero and pi, you can clearly see that this goes to zero. So almost no energy flux is going in forward direction. But sine square theta has a maximum along theta equal to plus or minus pi. Uh, so in these location it has a maxima. And so not minus pi, it is uh, plus pi. This is axially symmetric. So theta covers on both sides. Theta equals, um, you know, it's this is the z-axis, so theta constant is a cone, um, half cone, or what do you call it, I forgot about it. So theta constant is a cone, with the semi, uh, this angle, half angle being theta. Now this has a maximum at theta equals pi by 2, so most of the energy flux from this charge is going in an orthogonal direction to the acceleration. So if there's acceleration in this direction and vertically up, most of the power is being radiated out in the horizontal direction, okay? And then if you uh, revolve this diagram around this axis, you'll get a donut kind of a pattern. This is just a slice of a donut. But then imagine a third axis which is coming out of the plane of the screen, and you rotate along this axis, this diagram along this around this axis, and you'll get a donut shape. Griffiths has a nice picture, a picture of the 3D picture of this. You can look it up, but for simplicity, I'm just going to. Go. So the special thing about the polar plot is that um, uh, 
this this for example take a point here the length of this line like this line segment length of this line segment gives you the the magnitude of this okay this magnitude is given by this line segment and of course the direction is uh, giving you uh, this n vector n hat vector okay you must have come across some some similar kind of diagrams polar plots when you're doing quantum chemistry when you're um, depicting shape of orbitals there also you denote the uh, polar plot in which the magnitude of the wave function is given by the line joining the particular point um, to the origin so we can also find out, find out from the pointing vector power radiated in all directions the pointing vector gives you power radiated per unit area per unit time so uh, per unit so you have to multiply it by area to get the total power radiated per unit time so that's why i've multiplied by infinitesimal area in the direction n which is given by r squared times the solid angle uh, a small infinitesimal solid angle around this direction n and then we integrate this integration is very simple the solid angle is sine theta d theta d phi and then you integrate phi from 0 to twice pi and uh, theta from 0 to pi i have substituted this expression here so 1 over r square here gets cancelled by the r square of the area element and there's no r square here this integration is very simple to do and this is something which you will find in many books uh, it's a very prominent formula which um, perhaps you should be familiar with all of you should be familiar with um, the particularities of this is that it depends on the square of the acceleration so if a charge is moving with a constant velocity there'll be zero power emitted thus we also know because uh, constant velocity gives you quasi static electrical magnetic field and there's no uh, no radiation piece we saw that in the expression for the uh, radiation field e and b and also it's proportional to the square of the um, charge so this quantity q square a dot square we will see it one again once again when we talk about the dipole radiation dipole antenna but uh, this formula is very important it is giving you um, the power emitted by um, charge moving with an acceleration a prime with non-relativistic velocities okay with non-relativistic velocities velocity is not comparable to the speed of light this formula is known as Larmor formula it was obtained again in the late 1800s by the gentleman Larmor and then of course I have taken uh, you know the first order approximation is this small one we have dropped all terms to proportional to v over c or v prime over c however uh, you can also uh, you can just do uh, an expansion in v prime over c and then the leading term is just larmor and then you can compute the sub leading term as well which people have done uh, in fact leonor has done that is known as leonor's correction to larmor formula which is done in griffiths i won't do that case people who are curious about it please look up griffiths now uh, let's consider the opposite limit in which the particle is not uh, not moving Initially, the particle is moving with velocity much less than c prime, um, speed of light. But let's look at other situation when v is of the same order as c. Okay, you might think this is a fantasy, but it is not. In um, particle accelerators, and, and this is a very common thing in which electrons, protons, and all of other particles are made to move with velocities comparable to the speed of light, few percentages of the speed of light. And the radiation for this, uh, radiation pattern for this is pretty complicated, as you can guess, because the E and B, B field, this is the general expression. Um, so the general expression would be very complicated. And um, we will consider special cases to gain some intuition. So um, one thing it is that the, here, in the earlier case, it didn't matter what the particle velocity was. As long as it is non-relativistic, we could throw it away. And the, um, it's just a pure function of the acceleration. It could have been acceleration square, velocity square, but there, there's no velocity, um, you know, appearing in the Larmor formula, which tells us that it is pretty independent of the velocity. However, um, when you have velocities of the charged particle um, comparable in magnitude to the speed of light, what happens is that this factor will play a role. So we will take special cases. First case is when V is parallel to A. So the acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity. For example, this would happen if you leave a particle um, at rest in a constant electric field. Then the electric field would pull it in direction, 
So that will create a velocity and acceleration all lining up together. So in this case, the cross product of V, V prime and A prime is zero. And this we can use this fact um, to simplify the expressions a little bit. So in this case, as I've written, the expression is almost same as the non-relativistic case, except for this factor in red, which is one minus, actually this should be V prime, I'm sorry, um, to the cubed. So this extra factor is going to be uh, contributing. And uh, if you take theta to be the angle between A and N, so then N dot V is uh, V over C cos theta. This should be V prime, I missed that. And then you can work out the power, which is given by this formula. Okay, so from this you have to calculate the B field, which is very simple to calculate because it is N hat crossed with E divided by C, and then the pointing vector will be given by the square of the electric field um, uh, divided by multiplied by epsilon naught and so on. So that's very easy to compute, and you'll be seeing that this depends on this factor. Now, what is new compared to the uh, older case? First, let's think of the similarities. Again, you have Q square, A prime square, so it, if it's constant velocity, no radiation. Uh, it, has to it has to depend on the acceleration. In particular, it's square of the acceleration, square of the charge. This part is, was already there, nothing new. Um, the sine square factor was also there, uh, which is still there here. However, this new factor is there. So what happens uh, when you have theta going to zero? Theta going to zero, cos theta is almost one, and sine theta is zero. So if V is same as C, or of the order of C, this becomes very small, as theta becomes zero. So this this is a zero, zero by zero expression, but there are six powers in the, uh, because this is one minus something of the order of one. So one minus order one, so that is a very small quantity, and it is raised to the sixth power while this is only the second power. So this factor was going to win and there's going to be a large amount of radiation in the direction of the acceleration, okay? So in the direction, that's why we see this lobe which gives you the forward direction, uh, you see there is an enhancement. On the other hand, for the reverse direction, when theta equal to pi, this becomes a one plus order one. So one plus one is not zero, so this factor wins and you have no charge, no radiation in the backward direction. But in the forward direction, things change a bit. So a lot of radiation going in the forward direction. Of course, exactly in this forward direction it is zero because unless V is exactly equal to C, these two. But anywhere around close to theta equal to zero, there'll be a lot of radiation. So one exercise which you can do is to find out what is the maximum. If from this a formula for the uh, differential power, you can find out where is the maxima and it is uh, what is the relation to the velocity, okay? So that is an, uh, one exercise you guys can do. Okay, the second special case we're gonna consider is when V is perpendicular to E. So the velocity and acceleration perpendicular. And one example of such is when a particle is moving in a magnetic field. So magnetic field we know, um, the in a magnetic field, um, particles, um, charged particles undergo circular motion. So circular motion, you know, this acceleration is directed towards the center, the, the centripetal acceleration when the velocity is directed tangential. So this is one such example. The previous example, this example was when you have an electric particle moving in an electric field. And then the particle itself, one, one, when it is accelerating in, in the electric field, it will itself start to emit its own, uh, create its own radiation, electric and magnetic field. So it is, this field is not the original electric field which has caused the particle to accelerate, but this is the um, electric uh, radiation field produced by the particle as a response to its acceleration. Similarly, when a particle is made to go into a circular motion due to an external magnetic field, it will start to radiate with these kind of uh, electric and magnetic fields. I, I didn't bother to write the magnetic field because um, it is given by N cross E and the pointing vector because n hat, e and b form a triad. You can easily write down in terms of e and n hat what this is. And you can see this is a pretty complicated mess. By the way, this, this uh, radiation is known as synchrotron radiation. When you have a magnetic field and a particle is executing, charged particle is executing circular motion and the radiation is emanating from it is known as synchrotron radiation because this happens in a synchrotron. Um, 
so this expression looks pretty complicated. Uh, in particular, uh, you see what you didn't have in the earlier case is when this azimuthal asymmetry, azimuthal asymmetry is there. So not only does it depend on theta, which is um, so. Uh, let me just back up a little bit. I think I just went too fast. So this is the n hat vector in spherical polar coordinates. The acceleration is in the vertical direction. If we have the diagram, so the acceleration is in the vertical direction. The velocity is orthogonal to it in the z direct, y direction. So this is z and the y. And the x direction is pointing towards the viewer out, coming out of the screen. X direction is coming out of the screen, um, pointing towards the viewer. Uh, so uh, this is how the vectors are set up. And then you can compute these quantities, take the dot products. When you compute e dot e, you have to take the dot product of this vector with itself. And you see that it doesn't only depend on theta, but it also depends on phi, the angle with the x-axis, which is known as the azimuth. So this is not easy to draw because it's a three-dimensional diagram. You need to draw the x-axis as well. However, what we have shown is the plane of motion. That is to say, this is uh, the, let's say the particle is moving in a circular, uh, a circular trajectory, which is on the plane of the screen. Okay, on the plane of the screen. And at this point, at the point of the origin, the velocity is horizontal like this and along the y-axis, while the centripetal acceleration towards the center, which is in this direction. Okay? So on the plane of motion, then phi can only take values plus pi by 2 and minus pi by 2, right? Let me think about it, yeah. Plus pi by 2, and from x, the y-axis, from the x-axis, the azimuth is measured from the x-axis, so this is the y-axis, so this is plus phi by 2, and then on the other anti-clockwise anti clockwise direction, you will also have minus phi by 2. So you can clearly see, if you plug it in this formula, when uh, phi is uh, plus phi by 2, of course, this factor dies, and this factor doesn't change whether it's plus or minus phi by 2. But the denominator, the factor gets affected whether phi is plus phi by 2 or minus phi by 2. Okay, so when it is plus phi by 2, this is, uh, this is a negative number. So the, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, one, this is one minus something, so it's less than one. So one over some, less, something, less minus, something less than one to the sixth power would make this a large quantity. On the other hand, when phi is equal to minus phi by two, this, this minus sign becomes plus, and so this becomes small. So that's why we have a small amount of radiation in the negative y-axis versus uh, the positive y-axis. So most of the radiation in here, um, is in the direction of the velocity, okay? A large amount of radiation comes in the direction of the velocity. Huge amount of radiation. And little amount of radiation is, so this I think is drawn for uh, when V over C is 0.3, so it's 3% the speed of light, 30%, I'm sorry, 30% the speed of light. As you keep on increasing, this will be keep on shrinking and shrinking, and most of the light will be radiated in uh, uh, the direction of V, okay? So uh, you can plot this using Mathematica, and check whether you're getting the explicit um, pattern or not. Okay, this was all about um, point charges moving in vacuum. You can ask the same question for what about a point charge moving in media? And well, the analysis is pretty straightforward. All the things we said about linear Richard potentials and uh, you know retarded potential in general, it's easy to obtain. Just replace the vacuum permeability and permittivity by the corresponding um, uh, medium permittivity and permeability and replace the speed of light by the speed of light divided by the index. Okay, so uh, this is what we have exactly done. Tell this region, the solution remains the same except the coefficient changed here from epsilon naught to epsilon and mu naught changed to mu. Okay. So for V less than the speed of light in the, va in the, medi in the medium, so for velocities of charge, less than the speed of light in that medium, nothing really changes. All these uh, diagrams we have, you can reproduce all of them. Uh, there's no, it, everything goes um, true, except instead of speed of light, you will have the speed of uh, light in that medium. Instead of speed of light in vacuum, you'll have the speed of light in the medium. So nothing really changes physics-wise. It's more or less a similar mechanism. It makes a big difference when we look at velocities um, greater than the speed of light in that material medium. So you can consider this to be superluminal motion in that medium. It doesn't mean it violates special relativity, because special relativity says nothing can cross the speed of light in vacuum. 
but it can happen that the charge is in a medium can might move with a velocity larger than the speed of light in that medium. In that case, the analysis has changed drastically, and I will not do this. I will just mention the effect of this: is that radiation is emitted even when there is no acceleration. So even for uniform motion, there'll be uh, associated radiation. Okay, I will not do the analysis because it'll it's pretty uh, lengthy. Again, nothing complicated, but it's just we don't have the time to go through the analysis step by step. This is why I re referred to the book by Held and Marion. Uh, it's a book just on electromagnetic radiation and it discusses all these cases. So, uh, so EM radiation fields confined inside a MAC cone which is trailing the charge. And this happens because, and this you must have some experience with this when you studied sonic booms or uh, in the context of sound when you had a particle moving through a medium with supersonic speed. Um, whenever the particle is moving, it leaves on its wake uh, cone, of shock cone, which is the envelope of a shock wave which is trailing the object. Here also you have something like that. You'll have, instead of a sonic boom, you'll have a shock wave, in optical shock wave, um, uh, and the wave front will have an uh, envelope which is a cone with the particle being at the tip of the cone because um, the particle is emitting wave, uh, but it, uh, by the time the velocity of that wave, uh, particle is emi emitting a spherical pulse, but it itself is uh, crossing the spherical pulse, uh, pulse uh, faster because its velocity is larger than the speed of light. As a result, um, the wave front will be contained within a cone with the particle at the tip of the cone, okay? And the angle of the cone is given by this famous relation, Max relation. Most of you know this from sound waves. Except with the speed of, um, instead of the speed of sound, I've put the speed of uh, light in that medium here. That's the only difference. Okay, um, so I'm sorry about this. Anybody who wants to look at this in uh, detail should look at the Helton Marion's book. Now, uh, moving on, um, this was for a point charge. We discussed it, uh, I think we more or less we discussed it pretty completely. Now, I want to talk about radiation from system of charges. So, uh, EM radiation, which is emitted by a radio or radar antenna, is the superposition of the radiation field of large number of electrons surging back and forth along the antenna. Right? So, um, that is a more practical, uh, um, you know, application of this. For a large number of charges inside a conductor, uh, we will describe the system by a charger current distribution. We cannot just, you know, just manually superpose large number of electrons. The best thing is to replace this point electrons, discrete electrons, by a continuous charge distribution. And then uh, from the required potential expression, remember the retarded potential expression is true for in generic charge distribution. Yeah, so. This is true for generic charge distribution, so we will just uh, use the current distribution here, plug in the current distribution here, and uh, obtain the E and B rad, the radiation part, directly. So this formalism is nice, and it just not just applies to antenna, but to atoms or molecules of nuclei as well. We will see that. Um, and what we will find that the time dependence of the current leads to emission of radiation. This we should not be surprised because we've seen when the current is steady, that is, there's no time dependence, then it creates a bio uh, law kind of magnetic field, magnetostatic fields, and there's no radiation in them. However, at the moment the star current starts to vary with time, it will lead to the emission of radiation. So the retarded potentials are given by this expression, which I have once more. Now, uh, let's assume that the source is localized, as I said, not just localized, it is um, um, the distance within the source is much smaller compared to where the measurement is taking, the electric field is being measured okay, or received. So that distance is very far from x. So x minus x prime is almost, uh, it is so large, we can tailor expand around x prime, x prime equals 0. Because of this, we can tailor expand around this. This we have done many times in electrostatics. Um, so we will tailor expand around uh, x prime equals zero, and you can convince yourself that the expansion, the first order term, will be given by this. So the similar and equal to sign means I'm reducing it, I'm expanding it uh, in Taylor expansion around x prime equals zero, and I'm keeping the uh, linear order term. That's it. No more qu quadratic piece or anything. 
This is a multi-variable um, Taylor expansion. So actually, we're expanding in three variables. And you should remind yourself uh, how to do this. And then I'm going to plug it back in this expression. Um, so I'm going to plug back this expansion in this expression. So for the denominator, uh, we will be just content with replacing it uh, with the leading order term, so just x. So this expression is leading order. It will not vary. So we can bring it, it, it is independent of the integration variable, so we can use this x prime, we can bring this x prime modulus outside of the integral, which is what we have done. So the denominator we've gotten rid of. In the numerator, it is this, um, the, this variable appears in this retarded time. So we will, this is what I've done. X minus X prime I've replaced by this quantity. And then of course, X prime is the location where this is uh, physically located. So uh, this is a simplification we will adopt. And this applies only when you have localized sources, okay? Now the magnetic field can be taken by taking a curl of this uh, vector part. So one, two, three, the vector component of this equation. We will take a curl of that. So the curl, uh, because it is on the x variable, so it will act on this guy. So this is the first term. So uh, this and then cross with this, plus when the curl will hit this guy. So curl of j, and when it hits this guy. Now, divergence of one over x, it's like a derivative of one over x will cross, will lead to one over x squared. So this will be a Coulomb piece because it falls off as one over x squared. So I've dropped it. So although we should not call it equality, um, we should say that you know this is the radiation part. And this will not be the radiation part. This will be the Coulomb piece, and we can throw it away uh, because it doesn't contribute to radiation. For radiation, we are just interested in this part. It's where which is I have retained this term. Okay, and then uh, curl of J. Um, this quantity I can. Uh, do further simplifications, curl of j. I can do further simplification and write it as d dt of uh, t. Again, these simplifications, I will, um, uh, how do we write from this form to this form? I will post some notes in which uh, these steps will become clear. Um, but the idea is that um, curl um, implies we have to take spatial derivatives. But then on the spatial derivative in J come only in this term, the second term, this first term, in the time coordinate. So uh, first we have to take a derivative with respect to the time coordinate, and then, uh, so d d t, actually t r, but then t minus something as same as t r is same as d d t, d d t r is same as d d t, or del del t, I'm sorry, partial derivative. And then how t r itself is, uh, is a function of x, so this is kind of the chain rule you can think so by chain if you apply chain rule uh, It will turn out that B is given by minus X hat crossed 1 over C del A del T. Okay, so very simple expression um, You can also find out the electric field now remember we're working with Lorentz gauge So this will give us a very simple expression. So I won't go through the detailed steps, but they are very simple to follow this is the definition of the electric field in terms of the potential. Remember, the potential is the fourth zeroth component of this four vector A0. A four vector, uh, um, four, fourth comp a zeroth component of the four vector, which is A0. And then you have to multiply by C2 for dimensional insanity. And then, of course, uh, um, I'm sorry, what am I doing? Yeah, we use Lorentz gauge to replace this. Uh, remember what Lorentz gauge is? Del A0 del T plus divergence of A. So we will have some formula and those two terms we can combine into a single expression, okay? Because diver whenever we have divergence acting on A, it can be converted into partial derivative using the chain rule, partial time derivative using the chain rule. So all the manipulations can be done and what you can show is the ultimate result of this is very simple it is the magnetic field c times the speed of light times uh, cross with minus x hat okay the very simple looking formula so um, let's consider um, some cases here so the, all this was general theory i didn't really 
we're talking at the general child distribution, current distribution, uh, with just uh, general theories. There's no special cases. Now let's look at a special case which is known as the half-wave antenna. So before we do that, um, let's remember what we ignored when we do this approximation. So when we do this approximation, what we are throwing away is this quantity, this quantity which we threw away, and this is equal, proportional to j times 1 over x squared, right, j times 1 over x squared, and we threw away because we said it falls off faster, and then this term is proportional to, so this will become uh, 1 over c dt, right, because we saw using chain rule it can be converted in, into a time derivative, and for dimensional reason there should be 1 over c, that's what we have here, 1 over c. Now if this is the case, the j's don't really matter in this equation, but if we have an oscillating electric field, the c dt uh, will be of the order of c times d, and for appreciable change will be of the order of the frequency, or the time period, so replace this by the time period. The c times the time period uh, will give you the wavelength. So uh, this is true, uh, when you have the wavelength, because here you will get the factor of the wavelength, and when you invert, the sign will change. So this is true only you have when you have the field far away from, uh, I'm sorry, location of the field, location of the point in the electric field, which is of course far away from the source. Not only that is true, but also this is much larger. The distance from the source to the field is much larger than the wavelength. Okay, so this is the kind of hidden assumption which is going in, which is sometimes known as the far field or far zone. And this is the special case we are interested in, which is known as the half-wave antenna. What we have here is a radio frequency generator, which is being fed into a conductor, which is a linear conductor, a straight line, in which what we have, we send signals on the left and the right. So these uh, um, signals, electrical wave, beam, oscillating EM waves, propagate down the antenna get reflected at the end and come back. And same thing happens for the bottom end as well, bottom half as well. And they superpose themselves and they create a standing wave pattern with a maxima at the middle. Okay, so this is the, I'm sorry, it went below. Uh, it's I naught, which is the maximum, times twice pi z over lambda, caught cos of omega t. This is the first harmonic of the standing wave which you create. Um, so there's a maxima at um, lambda by z equals zero, there's a maxima. So this is uh, z coordinate, this whole thing is lambda by two. Well, lambda is of course the wavelength of the radio frequency uh, wave which is being uh, fed into the conductor. And then this is why it's called a half wave antenna because the length of it is half the wavelength, okay? And this is a picture of um, the electric and magnetic field radiation, electric and magnetic field produced by this. So again, this is a point which joins the uh, x is the point in the field, and this is the vector which joins uh, x prime to x, and e and b are orthogonal to that direction, of course. So the potential for this situation, as you can guess, because the current distribution has only current along the z-axis, and the potential will only have, um, out of the four components, only one will be non-zero, which is the z-th component, or the th third component. Okay, A0, A1, and A2 are all zero. Okay, so this for the simple case, we can find out using the retarded formula. Instead of J dq of x, we'll have, because it's a linear, we'll have dz integrated over this current. And this integral is easy to perform. You can just plug it in Mathematica and just do this. Uh, it takes a second to perform this. And it gives you some expression, which is, uh, it's inversely proportional to the uh, frequency, one over, of course, the distance. This is, uh, typical of, as I said, of um, radiation fields. And then we can find out the magnetic field from this, okay? Magnetic field will be given by this formula uh, which we wrote down before, the general case, which is this. So remember x here, what x is, and uh, a has the z components of the cross product um, is given by this formula. I'm sorry, I forgot to wrote down the unit vector, but sine theta because the angle between uh, x and a, and a is this theta. 
the sine theta cross product gives you the sine theta and then of course this follows from the rest of it so this omega has gone away because the time derivative acting on the cosine will give you a sine and then it gets cancelled away uh, so we have this formula from this we can compute the pointing vector remember the pointing because e and b are orthogonal the pointing vector will be uh, x x hat x this is r hat actually this should be x hat x hat e and b form orthogonal or triad in that case it's easy to find out that e cross b will be in the direction of x hat with this magnitude and this magnitude is given by square of this quantity which we have done so the power radiated is given by this okay so this quantity is, has to ever be averaged over time when I say time averaged so this power of course is fluctuating per unit it's an oscillating source so the power is fluctuating so on over a cycle uh, we have to average this power over a cycle how much power is lost so uh, imagine this bar this bar means time average the sine square omega t time average will give you I think a half so the, there goes a half and then these factors will be there so this is the power which is radiated in the theta direction in the theta direction um, this is the energy radiated in the theta direction per unit time so over all direction we have to integrate over all theta so uh, as you can see this is in the solid angle around theta we've integrated over all that so this is sine theta d theta d phi integral of this so that will give you this formula which is another well-known formula I forgot to mark it in red but this is another formula which is the total power emitted by a half wave antenna okay you can check the dimensional consistency of both sides I will ask you to do this exercise and check whether these factors are correct or not whether both sides have dimensions of power or not I'm asking you to do this because there might be some mistakes when I, I might have missed some factors of C or something so please check and tell me let me know if there was some um, error in the um, factors of C or anything okay so this was the half wave emitter which is very commonly used in electrical engineering uh, I wanted to include this material because uh, you know this would be a nice uh, application uh, of, of the radiation theory we are learning. So uh, half wave antenna of course is a special case when we have the antenna is pretty large compared to the wavelength that is of the order of the wavelength. But uh, think about the situation when we have emissions from molecules or atoms. Then the wavelength is much larger than the size of the atom, right? So for that the treatment would be a bit different and for which we, we will call that the dipole antenna. Okay, dipole antenna is a situation when we have uh, sources as much smaller than the wavelength of the light being radiated okay so for that what we have to do is to tailor expand the current remember we we first in the far zone we expanded this retarded time was expanded in the stator expansion now we have to further take the case when this is smaller than this quantity so uh, this is what we will do when we need the dipole antenna so we have this so we are expanding in the time coordinate so the, remember there's the time coordinate and the x so we are ex Taylor expanding in this coordinate around t minus x prime so this is the uh, small um, this is the uh, you know expansion parameter so this is the linear order and higher order that we are setting to zero okay so we will approximate this whole thing by just the le leading term so when is this situation valid and this is valid for sources compared smaller compared to the wavelength how do we see that well um, this is JMU so the first term is JMU and this term is supposed to be much much less than JMU but this term is this quantity now uh, you can see that this is the unit vector of unit norm so it doesn't really contribute but this this depends on the size of the source let me call it a little a so A over C and this fluctuation happens over a period time period so I can replace uh, del J over del T by J over big T the time period and C times the time period will really give you lambda and then the J will cancel uh, not cancel literally but yeah the effects will be the same on both sides so that doesn't contribute so we have A divided by lambda much much less than 1 which means A is much much less than lambda A is the size of the source so this happens I would say for example if you have emissions from atoms or molecules and nucleus when the size of the atom or molecule or nucleus is much smaller than the radiation wavelength the wavelength that is emitting the radiation 
So if we combine, initially we had a source much, much smaller compared to where the field is uh, being measured. So field is measured somewhere outside the source, which is much smaller compared. Now we also have this, this condition. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. So the, the small source was initially this, far zone was this, when the wavelength was much shorter compared to where the field was being measured. And now we have this. So the, this condition, the dipole antenna is valid when this um, double inequality is satisfied. So now, uh, now let's plug this in the, um, you know, the retarded potential formula and let's find out what this is. So this is an approximate version. Uh, so this is the, we'll compute the vector potential first because we want to get to the magnetic field. So the vector potential will need will mean integration over the vector j. So vector j, and I've not bothered to write the first uh, part, which is this, the, the retarded time, x minus t minus x over c. So I just put a comma and there's empty before that, but um, that means that I have the retarded, it's cumbersome to carry it around all the time. So now uh, we will do a set of tricks which you, you'll find uh, very useful. First is the integral of j vector can be written uh, by using integration by parts in this way. So x prime time, uh, times, the, uh, times the gradient of the divergence operator with respect to the prime coordinate acting on j. Okay, And you can check by yourself by doing integration by parts, indeed it gives you this plus a surface term which goes to zero at infinity because there is no source at infinity. The source is localized. For example, an atom or a molecular nucleus. So it's a small source localized at infinity. The surface term will go to zero. And then once we have divergence of j, we can recall continuity equation, which is divergence of j plus del rho del t equals zero. So this minus divergence of j, I will replace by del rho del t. And then we'll do the same trick as we have done before. If we have a time derivative over a spatial integral, we'll pull the time derivative outside provided we convert that into a total derivative because the x prime gets integrated anyway so it'll it will not be a partial derivative it will be a total derivative because the x prime dependence get integrated out completely okay so uh, so we have ddt of integral of rho times this x now this is some kind of moment of charge so d cube x times rho is infinitesimal amount of charge located at x prime and then multiplied by the vector x prime, so the position vector x prime. So this is some kind of moment of charge. Sometimes it's known as the dipole moment. So this kind of quantity you're familiar from mechanics already, a uh, moment of mass by which you try to define the center of mass. So this is some kind of uh, center of defining, uh, you know, some kind of moment of charge. It is sometimes known as the dipole moment and is denoted by the letter P. So this is DDT of P. But remember that the, this, the time coordinate before the comma, which I have um, not shown, is actually this t minus x prime over c. So this is the rate of change of the dipole moment, but evaluated at the retarded time, not at the time t. So this derivative has to be evaluated not at the um, time in which we are measuring the magnetic field, but at some earlier time. Okay. So once we have this, we can write down, um, so we can easily write down, so we have done this integration already. So this integration has been done and been found to be rate of change of the dipole moment at the retarded time. So this writing down the magnetic field, uh, magnetic vector potential is now easy. It is mu naught by 4 pi x times this dipole, uh, rate of change of dipole moment. And again, I've introduced the square brackets. The square bracket means I'm evaluating the quantity at the retarded time. So whenever I put square brackets, you should think of this quantity. Electric and magnetic fields, again, we already know that we are familiar with the expression for it. Uh, let me go back a little bit. Yeah, electric and magnetic fields are given by these two expressions. Uh, from A vector, you find out uh, the B, and from the B, you can find out the E. Okay, so a derivative of second derivative will lead to a second derivative of the dipole moment. So it's an accelerating or oscillating uh, dipole. And then E can be found out using this formula. Further, we can find out the pointing vector. Again, the pointing vector will be in the x direction, uh, in the direction of P. Um, so this is the expression. You can compute this uh, using these expression. You can compute this formula. 
so this also has a dipole, uh, this is the famous donut pattern. Remember, at theta equal to zero. So theta is the angle between the, um, actually I forgot to write this, theta is the angle between the p and the x direction, okay? This is the angle between the x and the p direction. There is a sine theta appearing here. Um, so, and then here also another sine theta. So this will be sine square theta comes from, so this is the angle between this. So if the dipole is along the vertical axis, uh, there's no radiation along the direction of oscillation of the dipole. Instead, uh, so it is orthogonal to that. So this is the dipole pattern, it will again be a donut. Uh, let me just go back. Yeah, something like this. If this is P double dot, then this is how it will look like. And then there's an azimuthal symmetry. So you can spin this uh, around the uh, P double dot axis. So you can spin this around and that will generate a donut. Um, you can compute the total power, which will be an integral over sine zeta d theta d phi d phi. Um, phi going from 0 to 2 pi and theta going from 0 to pi. So, and that uh, formula will give you this mu naught over 6 pi c p double dot mod square. Now, um, a point particle is one example of a dipole antenna because it is a point particle. It is definitely smaller than any wavelength it emits. And for the point particle, we know this quantity is just q times the position because the integral del rho is just a point particle, so it will give you integral del rho will give you just q. So this is qx, right? Q times the position vector. The derivative of that will be Q times the velocity. And the double derivative will be Q times the acceleration. So this is Q square, acceleration square, times mu naught by 6 pi c. And sure enough, if you go back and check the Larmor formula, you have exactly 6 pi c and Q square, A prime square. So exactly this factor. So we have reproduced the Larmor formula by using this dipole antenna <coughs> formulas. So this is a very nice check that this indeed this formula expression is correct. Um, so uh, we will stop here. You can, of course, uh, if you look at Griffiths, it has done much more than this, what I've talked about, because it keeps this term. This term is known as the quadrupole term, sorry, magnetic uh, dipole term, and then so on, quadrupole term, and so on and so forth. If you keep more and more terms in the Taylor expansion, the dipole pattern will change. Uh, we will not do all that. I wanted to do the basic necessary minimum for this course. Half-wave antenna and dipole antenna, I think, are, are good beginning points, which every undergrad should know, so I will cover that. And uh, our course will end here. So please email me your queries. Uh, this is a long... A bit of a long, um, I think, lecture. Please try to do the derivations. I will send up, send you supplementary notes to supplement these uh, many derivations which I've skipped. They're not difficult. It's just that they require a little bit of algebra. Um, that's all. It's a bit messy, so I didn't want to show them in the slide because they don't give you any insight, and it's just uh, complicated algebra. Um, so I will post some notes on which you can check all these. And let me know if there were typographical factors, errors. I might have missed factors of C. I've tried my best to uh, be on top of this, but you know, SIC system of units is a mess. If it's for CGS, I would have um, done with much less uh, effort. I've tried to be error free, but be cautious because many books have a lot of errors uh, in them, especially in this radiation part, because with all this uh, E and B squared and factors of C and mu naught and all that um, being thrown around, I would a good way to check would be to see dimensional consistency of both sides, and uh, that is one way I operate. Um, of course, that will not still not give you whether it's going to be six pi or twelve pi. Those factors are of course hopeless; you cannot find them. Um, let me know if you have queries or clarification. I'm sure you're going to have it. I have a lot of them, so please uh, email them to me or we can set up a Google Meet. Um, okay, so that's about it. Um, and next time we will meet, we will meet for the final exam, which will be whenever the school reopens. I have no idea when that is going to happen. 
but hopefully uh, sometime in uh, late July or September, August, uh, whenever that school reopens, we will see for the final. I will also post two uh, problem sets which will be solved for your benefit so that you know what kind of uh, questions, what, what type of questions can you expect for the final. It will be completely different from what you had expected in the quizzes because they will be uh, subjective problems where you have to uh, do a lot of uh, you know, calculations. Uh, there won't be numerical calculation, but there will be analytical calculations. Okay, um, thank you. I'll stop here.